The Supernatural Book, Episode Number Eight Hunters of Men. Well, time went on, and Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth were literally older than the hills and the Grand Canyon. Literally, I mean, Noah was up in his 900s, Shem, like 500 or so, I guess. Noah probably wasn't getting around like he used to, but he was still a preacher of righteousness and the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old men is the gray head. And Noah had a gray head and inside of it was wisdom, facts, understanding. And he was, I'm guessing, a walking illustration book because look at what he'd done been through. I mean, you live 900 and something years, you're going to have so many illustrations you could use. And I'm sure Noah got up every day and preached the word of God that he had. You know, he had the sword. He had the piece of the sword that God had gave him, and that was his weapon. He was most, uh, the Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness, so that leads me to believe he was preaching the word instant in season, out of season, re reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. I doubt that he stopped even just because uh, the storm was over, I doubt that Noah stopped. I'm sure he had so many ark illustrations that they called him the ark preacher or something. I guarantee he was uh, preaching that same message. Most likely he heard Enoch preach on those cassettes. And obviously I know they didn't probably didn't use cassettes, but who, uh, who knows what the technology was like before the flood? You never know. Uh, do you think he would have forgot those days of being scoffed at and ridiculed and beaten down and feeling defeated and God being the only person on his side? That type of thing really puts some preaching in you. And he was blessed with many years, but there were many dark days. And Ecclesiastes 11.8 says, But if a man lived many years and rejoiced in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness. For they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Noah got up to 900 and something years old. But remember, you don't know when your life's going to end. He didn't know when his life was going to end. Even after that many years, the Bible says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Noah probably thought, you know, where was the years? Where has the years gone? I remember when I was 777. And I didn't think I'd make it past 666. That was a rough year. He probably thought. Because, you know, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath, we spend our years as a tale that is told. You know, he lived 900-something years, and we just got like three chapters about him and his life, and most of it's about the ark and the flood. Imagine his grandchildren hearing the stories about what the earth was like before the flood with the giants and the wicked men and the dinosaurs. Noah really most likely spent the rest of his years as a tale that is told. He would have had some tales to tell about those giants and those wicked men. And the imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. And, you know, they say that's where the dinosaurs walked. A lot of Bible believers think, you know, the dinosaurs walked right before the flood. Because, you know, if reptiles continue to grow as long as they're alive, and they obviously would have had longer lives back then, just like people, well, there's your dinosaurs. They just, those reptiles would have kept growing all those years until you had a T-Rex. If there were dinosaurs, I'm sure the kids wanted to hear stories about it over and over. I'm sure Noah had the head of one mounted in the living room. But these, there's no telling how technology advanced the earth was before the flood. Technologically advanced. Uh, there's no telling what they had. They, they may have had just as much or more inventions that we have today and then God wiped it out in the flood because he doesn't like it. And I'm sure Noah had some stories about it. They may have had tele teleportation devices for all we know. Uh, Noah was one of the only people you could say was literally almost old as Methuselah. 
That was Noah's papa, you know, and Methuselah was walking the earth when Adam was alive, so imagine the information that Noah had in his wide margin Bible. Methuselah could have rubbed shoulders with Adam. And if Methuselah is your grandpa, then you've got somebody to talk to that talked to the first man, that talked to the 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 man that heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and talked to God and heard his audible voice and um you you were there for the you were you're talking to somebody who was there at the beginning imagine the information you would have imagine the information adam would have had that he would have passed it down so imagine the information that noah had in his wide margin bible in his sword the greatest weapon that he possessed i'm sure methuselah expounded genesis 1 through 3 to noah better than anybody ever did I mean, if uh, he would have heard Adam tell how it went down better than anybody, right? What I'm getting at is Noah would have had more knowledge than your average Joe, and I'm sure he used his knowledge to try and keep things from going south again. God had spoken words to him directly, and he would have passed those down. And you know, as the Lord says in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I'm sure he, uh, Noah did his best to train his grandkids up in the way they should go, and tried to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the Lord used him to start the human race all over again. But it didn't take long, and things were getting back in the gutter, just like they always were. The time came that they wouldn't endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they heaped to themselves teachers having itching ears. And even though Noah would have had the best preaching, the best teaching, and it still just doesn't take long for man to be man, and the evil men and seducers waxed worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And Noah would get up every morning as an old man and work with his hands. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he studied to be quiet and to do his own business and to work with his own hands. And whatever his hand found to do, he did it with his might. Just like when he got up and built that ark. He may have retired from ark building, but he wasn't retired from the ministry. And he was determined to fight a good fight and finish his course and keep the faith. And he knew there was laid up for him a crown of righteousness. And it didn't take long for Noah to see the trouble in the line of Ham. And he would turn on the news, and it was a bunch of fake news. It was like watching a puppet show. They all read off the same lines word for word, and Noah would sit there full of righteous indignation, probably saying, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil that put darkness for light, and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. These people profess to be wise, they profess themselves to be wise and are become fools. Noah saw the corruption of the so-called preachers. He probably said, through good words and fair speeches, they deceived the hearts of the simple. And once again, Noah would have become the crazy conspiracy theorist. He would again become preaching against their music, their lifestyle, their occult symbols. And it might have had something to do with that curse that line of ham got. And... Remember that Canaan has a curse on him. You remember when uh, Ham walked in on Noah and he actually curses Canaan because of it. So that line's got a curse on it. That might have something to do with the wickedness that was going on. In Genesis ten six. it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Foot and Canaan. Noah's grandson, Cush, had a boy named Nimrod. Genesis 10, 8 says, And Cush beget Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So Cush was a bit rough around the edges himself. I mean, he, he named his son Nimrod, which means rebel, and Nimrod just happens to be the 13th from Adam. And when he hit 13, he probably really kicked in high gear toward hell. He was a, a I guarantee you, he was a renegade, a devil without a cause. He He had sympathy for the devil. He was bound and determined to be a bad boy for life and his friends were all his friends were heathens and he lived and breathed a wicked lifestyle he was a rough character um, i guarantee you he probably liked fast life fast women fast cars and his bumper stickers probably said 
you only live once and coexist. I mean, he was a rough, tough, heterosexual male, but he probably believed love is love, so he probably had a little pride sticker on there too. And Genesis 10, 9 says, <clears throat> And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He wasn't just your average hunter. He might have started out hunting animals, but not for long. He wasn't just out there hunting lions and tigers and bears. He was hunting men. And the legend was, he used a leopard as a hunting dog. That was just what the legend is. I mean, he's hunting big game. And Jeremiah 5.26 says, For among my people are found wicked men, they lay wait. As he that setteth snares, they set a trap, they catch men. You know, uh, a lot of men, there's men out there that get a thrill hunting other men. And there's something frightening about men who hunt other men. So this rebel named Nimrod, the 13th from Adam, is someone you you really wouldn't want to run into on Friday the 13th or on any other day of the month, really. Uh, I doubt he was packing a machete and a ski mask, but he was a, a rough character that you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. And I imagine his house was the last house on the left on a haunted hill and maybe had cages hanging from the ceiling with men he would let loose and hunt in his backyard. It says in Genesis 10.10 10, that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel. He was a king. Uh, the devil had put in place a ruler that was on the dark side, and he puts into the heart of Nimrod to build a tower. And Nimrod is the mightiest hunter who is rumored to hunt with a leopard. Jokes aside, that's the real legend, and something even more crazy is that the devil uses the greatest hunter on earth as his hunting dog. And Nimrod is nothing more than a satanic puppet hunting dog. And... Uh, he thinks he has it all figured out, and he's going to deceive everybody, but he is also being deceived himself. And all these evil men and seducers that are deceiving everybody are being deceived themselves. They may even think they are doing God's service, even though they're doing the devil's service. And there are still hunters, hunters of men today, spiritually and physically. You have sex traffickers who hunt women and children. You have devil-possessed televangelists that are hunting souls. They get millions of dollars in exchange for the souls that they damn with their doctrines. You have corrupt government. You have entertainers who brainwash people with their lyrics and their words. And their words wrap around the soul of the listener. There's no new thing under the sun. Nimrod was doing it way back when. Nimrod may have been hunting the men who were going against his policies. And all this was to keep a one-world government, a one-world religion, all united under him. And Genesis 11, 4 says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So that old serpent was up there in the second heaven, and he's talking with those sons of God, and those evil angels are asking him, What in the world do you got these people doing down there? And Satan says, you idiots, don't you get it? If they can build that tower to reach the heaven, then we can make contact and come back down like we did back in Genesis 6. Uh, wait, what? You think the Lord would allow that? Well, he allowed it once already, didn't he? Satan said, I've got all these people together down there. They are really making a name for themselves. And with all the world joining forces, there is nothing we can't accomplish. I mean, they can do anything they set their mind to. They just have to get together in love and unity. They just have to realize that we really all worship the same God and, and uh, don't need to be uh, critical of each other's religions or sexual preference. I mean, you can't help who you love, right, guys? Uh, you can't help how you feel. I mean, I know Leviticus 18.22 is going to say, man should not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. But who says that's the right translation? They just got to realize that if we get together in a one-world government and a one-world religion, that there will truly be peace on earth. And then I can come down and be their king. God is just, you see, God is just so divisive. They need a king that can bring progress and unity. They need me. And the whole time this is going on, the Lord is up there in the third heaven shaking his head. And he says to Michael, or one of those angels, they're calling this guy Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Really, Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord? I know the Ten Commandments haven't 
been released yet, but I gave these fools enough sense to know that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the mighty hunter before the Lord, what a what a name, what a what a slogan for him. That's comedy. That is the height of stupidity. The height of their stupidity is reaching higher than that that tower that they're building down there. And even though they hate me and are in rebellion against me, I love people and I will have mercy on them. And he said, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And that mysterious hero of the story, the angel of the Lord, which was the Lord himself, come down and he messed up their whole plan. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now when someone is speaking jibber-jabber, you know what people say? Why are you babbling? Now when someone wants to get the attention of a, a stupid individual, they say, hey, Nimrod. You see, they really did make a name for themselves just like they set out to do in the first place. And legend has it that Shem, Noah's son Shem, killed Nimrod because he was spreading idolatry. That's not in the Bible. You know, it's a legend. I didn't say it was true, but uh, I wouldn't doubt it either. But that promised seed, it was going through Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, and Shem. Shem was carrying the promised seed that would one day put the Antichrist and Satan in hell. Nimrod is a type of the Antichrist, and it would make sense that Shem slays Nimrod, but we don't have any Bible for it. It's just one of those things that you talk about amongst your friends on a rainy day, just like a lot of this stuff I'm saying throughout this, just something to think about, talk about, speculate. But this is the supernatural book.